Those are some oldies but goodies, aren't they? If this is my story and this is my song, I ought to be praising my Savior all the day long. That's good stuff right there. That's good stuff. Great is thy faithfulness. We can go on and on. Thank you, Lord God Almighty. Go to Luke 11 and join me there. We covered 13 verses last week. We're going to cover uh, about another 15 or 16 today and uh, <clears throat> continue in our, in our series. We're going to have a little, maybe a, a different kind of message, like a little Bible study this morning and uh, a little segue into our Bible conference. Uh, we do have a Bible conference that's coming up. Uh, I sent an email out. Um, Wednesday, and uh, it kind of sounds like this. Not kind of, it sounds like this. Good afternoon, church family. Our Bible conference is fast approaching Friday 419 through Sunday 421. The theme of our conference is serious things from Acts 17, 10-11. In addition to our Bible conference, we will have the opportunity to ordain Alex Chippy, lay hands on him, lay hands on him as we send him out as a church planter to Lusaka, Zambia, this is a strong message of our serious commitment to the gospel mission and the searching of the scriptures daily, just as that passage says. Join us for this special time as our church, uh, as a church family. Our Bible conference is Friday evening, as it says up on the screen there. 419, we'll, uh, I'll make sure and send out another email and remind you this Wednesday, uh, 7 p.m. on Friday. 5.30 on Saturday, and then, of course, Sunday morning services like we always have here in our auditorium, and, of course, our regular uh, Sunday morning classes and groups will get together. And then Sunday evening, 5.30, we'll be having an ordination ceremony for Alex Chippy, laying hands on him, and uh, it should be good. Alex is going to be preaching the whole conference Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday morning. Make sure that you find the time to be here for all of them, one of them, make the ordination service on Sunday evening if you can. We will have little children stuff, five years old and under over here on the north side. We'll make sure that we have Faith Place friends working. Our nursery, uh, that means, of course, our nursery through pre-K. But we're going to do something a little different, and it's not that we don't have the people and resources, but... Friday evening and Saturday evening and Sunday evening, we're not going to have anything for our K through fifth grade. Have your kids, your children join you in church service. Is that possible that that's okay? They might be running the aisles. That'll be good for them. I figure at five, six years old, they probably can handle it pretty well sitting with their mom and dad or their mom or their dad or something in that case maybe their grandparents too so that'll be really really good we're looking forward to the weekend we're doing something a little different having a conference on a friday evening saturday evening and a sunday and uh, looking forward to doing that uh, i don't hope that's not a surprise because it's been on your calendar since you were handed this a number of months ago so again this can help you a little bit i do not put things out uh other than about 10 days to two weeks and then i'll uh, just reinforce it because I know if I send something out 30 days ahead, you may, ah, I got 30 days, eh, and you might forget it. So um, there's our communication. It's going to be called Serious Things, as I mentioned in the email. And uh, you see up there a little, a little bit of artwork as kind of a, a little bit of a Bible layout. And of course, it says there, the verse, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word. I love this passage of scripture. They received the word and they weren't messing around. And when they received the word, what did they do? It says there that with readiness of mind, they searched the scriptures daily. That's a serious commitment to the word of God. And we teach the word of God a lot here. And so the teaching side of it yeah, but how serious are we about searching the scriptures on our own daily? A reminder that we're here the 19th, the 20th, and the 21st, as that slide says up there. Uh, again, just a few days away. Take the time to be here. By the way, 
we'll have the coffee house open early each one of those evenings. And uh, Tantalize You will have maybe some little goodies out there, some sugary sweets so you won't fall asleep on Sunday, I mean on Saturday and Friday evening, okay? So make sure that uh, you come and, and partake in that special, special weekend coming up for us. I know that we will have hockey, ha ho hockey, we'll have Happy Five Soccer Club on Saturday morning, so just make sure you get to bed a little early. You don't get to bed early on Friday night anyway, so there you go. It'd be good to be at a Bible conference. When you look at where we were last week, let me just reread Luke 11, 1. It came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, of course, Jesus himself, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. Keep in mind, as we looked at the text last week, those first 13 verses, we entitled our message, um, Jesus, uh, help, help from Jesus on, on relationship skills. And uh, it was a really personal instruction again. As you go back to 10 and 9 and 8, we know Jesus' instruction much of the time is toward his disciples, very personal. Today our text from 14 down through 28 is going to look at the way Jesus deals with, in a very serious manner, a different kind of audience. You see, the disciples were always the most important audience for Christ's instruction. When they asked, Lord, teach us to pray, right? We just, we just read that, teach us to pray. Jesus directly addressed them with the proper framework for prayer. How do we talk to God? Again, we looked at it last week and said, hey, uh, prayer can be simply said, hey, it's just communicating with God. It's talking with God. Jesus Christ showed us that it was even more serious. And we saw, again, through Jesus' teaching and, of course, on this pattern, this, this framework, this layout, this is the way that you ought to go about prayer with the Father. He used this, hey, this is a passionate, persistent friend that really says, hey, we need to make sure that if something needs to be done for someone that there's a need met, we pray through it. And so that part of it was good. He also talked about the good kind of father, verse number 10. For everyone that asketh receiveth, he that receive, and he that seeketh findeth, to him that knocketh it shall be open. And then verse 11 really was pretty, pretty strong. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is father, will he give him a stone? If you ask for fish, would they give him serpent? If you ask for an egg, they offer him a scorpion. Again, the Father in heaven. He definitely has our best interests in mind. He is the Father you can go to. And so looking at that whole side of things and knowing that Jesus is talking to the disciples about that, he's saying, hey, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them than ask him? How much more? Hey, you ask of me, and I will give you if there's relationship in the Lord Jesus Christ there. Well, I think that in the midst of many times of the accounting in the Gospels, and of course it's not unintentional, in the midst of this great instruction between Jesus and the disciples, there's also this other bunch of people that are around for other kind of teaching. You see, beyond the disciples, Jesus had daily audiences made up of a variety of people. There were those who wanted teaching and healing. And there were the critics, of course, the doubters, the skeptics. Not everyone was a disciple. Now, you can kind of tell where this is going because of the text of the Word of God. You see... You and I should be aware of different audiences other than this audience right here. We should have personal interaction with people in our own life community that says, hey, I know how certain people operate. I know how certain people answer questions. I know the audience of people that I interact with 
when my, at my vocation, maybe in my neighborhood, maybe in the people that I talk with simply on the streets, the highways and byways about Jesus Christ. And you find out not everyone's a disciple. There's a, in fact, as we know in Luke's gospel, lots of different audiences. Luke chapter number six, we preached through that months ago. It highlight, I highlight verse number seven, scribes and Pharisees. They're, of course, an audience. And by the way, they were hawking Jesus and his disciples to see what they did wrong. And they're gonna come into play here, these Pharisees again. Verse number 17 tells us that in Jesus' sermon on the plain, that he had his disciples around him, but he also had a multitude. It was a great multitude of people out of Judea and Jerusalem. Chapter number seven, I highlighted a couple of other verses about those that would be in the audience. And it came to pass day after day that he went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him. So the disciples who were around him and much people, when he touches that basically old-fashioned hearse, or the bear as it's called, where they're carrying this dead boy, and he brings him back to life. Verse 36, it tells us in chapter number seven that there's one of the Pharisees that desired to have him meet, and he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. Again, there's different kinds of audiences. And the interaction with the audiences is always different. We've had some different messages in this, maybe two or three in the first 10, ten chapters about how Jesus interacts with people. So what is the audience like out there when we speak of the miracle of salvation to people? What is it like? See, I'm not so naive. I'd like to think that maybe I could just be innocent on this one. Because I don't know, maybe you haven't found out that people might be contentious because you haven't been talking to people about Jesus Christ. Maybe some of you haven't. You could give a witness and say, I got you, Pastor. Amen. You see, this message is based upon and built upon what the Scripture teaches and how Jesus Christ is interacting with an audience of people that aren't very happy with him. And he has a message for them. And he speaks of, very simply, when it comes to verse 23, you're either for me or against me. You're either going to scatter things or bring things together like I do. See, today I, I know that all of us listening to this word may not really grasp the whole idea or context of the audience because we don't talk to people about Jesus Christ. We know it's a constant challenge for us. We have conversations over every subject in the whole wide world. We actually sit with people and try to find some type of subject to talk to them about, and we get nervous about what are we going to talk about. And then on the other side, we have ADP Sports and Happy Five Soccer Club, and it's natural. We have soccer, we're going to play soccer. We're going to coach and we're going to teach children. We're going to have moms and dads around. We're going to sit down and have break time, and we're going to do a lesson on faithfulness. That happens to be the theme this year. It's pretty simple. We're going to ask questions about that. We're going to talk about faithfulness. We're going to talk about Noah and being faithful unto the Lord. And, and so there's already a dynamic setting. And it's already a setup there in terms of who's going to be there. And most everybody is receptive. By the way, and all the coaches over you know, here and the coaches here, I have never heard of any coach in 20 seasons, this is our 20th season, ever say, when I was talking to the kids, they got nasty at me, mean to me, and I had to kick them out of break time. It's a nice audience, isn't it? See, we like those kind of audiences. Like this audience right here, you're safe. Hey, I could come up and preach to this bunch of people. Well, come on up. I'll leave my notes and you can do it. Because this is a neat audience. You guys are awesome to talk to and preach to. But today I wonder if this will be tough. Tough to speak about and tough to receive because the title of our message is Battling the Audience. So I'm not going to battle you today. 
but I want you to see how Jesus Christ battled the audience. How we have to be in a place where if we're going to be in a, a battle, battling the audience, I put the ING on it this time, because it should be continual. It might be a one-person thing. It might be a two-person thing. It might be a little group of people. But what is it like battling the audience when you speak about the words of life, the words of truth, when you speak of theology and doctrine and you open up the Word of God and you say, hey, I'd like to have a Bible study with you. Do you have any questions? Or hey, I noticed that we've had some neat talks and maybe there's some things you don't know about. Would you be okay if I came over to your house and we could sit and visit over the Bible sometime? I'll answer any question according to the Bible. When's the last time you did that with somebody that wasn't pre-planned for you? You see, Jesus Christ knew of what was going to happen, but this wasn't a pre-plan. He heals somebody, kicks out a devil, and immediately they come after him. This isn't the first time. So what's it like battling the audience? Let's find out from Jesus today. Have a little study. I'm going to just run through some things, open up, look at some Bible verses. It's kind of like getting ready for the Bible conference. You'll need your Bible today to, in order to follow along. Let's read our text verses 14 through 28. Not a lot of verses here. We, we count 15 of them. Let's read our text, battling the audience. And he, speaking of Jesus, was casting out a devil, and it was dumb. And it came to pass when the devil was gone out, the dumb spake, and the people wondered. Okay, there's the setting, this audience. The people wondered. Now let's see who else is in the audience. Verse 15. And some of them said, He casteth out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils. Okay? You see that some people are not happy about this, and now they're being accusatory. Verse 16. And others, so some of them and others, tempting him, sought of him a sign from heaven. What an audience we got going on here. <whistles> Jesus takes hold of this scenario and this is what goes on in verse 17. And, but he, knowing their thoughts, said unto them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and a house divided against a house falleth. Not tough to handle that one. Good statement by Jesus, yes. Verse 18 tells us, if Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? You think I'm doing all this against Satan because I am? You're not making any sense with your argument. Because ye say that I cast out devils through Beelzebub, which means Lord of the flies. And if, verse number 19, I be Beelzebub, cast out devils, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore shall they be your judges. Keep in mind, the Jews had a way of doing some exorcisms. You find in the Old Testament, you find in the New Testament. If you write down Acts of the Apostles, chapter number 19, you'll see them, supposedly it looks like, being successful. Verse 20, but if I, with the finger of God, cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. Very powerful statement here the finger of God, we think going to Matthew's account of another, to me, another setting. It could be the same. It could be different. But similarly speaking, speaks of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of God's work. Verse 21 and 22 are quite interesting. When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. He's relating Satan as being the man who's the strong man. But when a stranger then, but when a stranger then he shall come upon him, overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusted and divided his spoils. Verse 23, I mentioned and alluded to it earlier. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth. 
when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, now to track this, it's very important, verses 24 through 26. Jesus is relating a mini little parable here. Watch this. This is an important principle. He walketh through dry places seeking rest. And finding none, he saith, I will return unto my house whence I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh to him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Wow. Wow. Verse 27 and 8, we'll include these in our text for today. And they fit. And it came to pass as he spake these things, a certain woman of the company, so this is the company, the other people, there's quite an audience, lifted up her voice. Very simply, she yelled. <laughs> she lifted up her voice. She wanted to be heard and says what? Hey, blesses the womb that bare thee and the paps which thou hast sucked. But he said... Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Some good stuff here, yes? So, we're battling the audience. Jesus is battling the audience. Not we, but Jesus is. But we can learn from this on how we should be battling the audience. I said it earlier, let me go a different route. For this message of Jesus and how he dealt with the audience and battling through things really have to take root, then we have, to, we have to do something. Something that maybe we haven't, again, done much of. It means that we're going to have to care a little more. We're going to have to have a little more compassion and a little bit more interest in other people's souls and lives. Because these audiences that Jesus Christ is up against is very, it's varied, and it is very, very clear, this message that Jesus is showing us that he dealt with everyone. You say, well, I can't do that because I'm not Jesus. Well, I don't know. I, I think that you and I are giving way too much credit to the strong man who's been defeated. It says in that simple simple little story context that his armor was taken from him, that the one who's more powerful and stronger wiped him out. Oh, the devil this and the devil that and the devil this and the devil that. Maybe today we must realize the audience is what the issue is and the audience is filled with people that do, do not like Jesus. They deny Jesus they have stories to argue and fight with you. They want to confront you over your belief system. They want to tell you that Jesus Christ is not God. You say, well, I know all that because I've heard somebody tell me about it when they had a witness, but I haven't done that because I, I don't know that firsthand because I haven't done that. I'm not here today to be a fruit inspector. That's somebody else's job. There are churches like that. I would ask you today to let the Holy Spirit of God examine your heart and soul and your mind when it comes to how much you and I really care about the audiences because these audiences are real. This audience, some people, these people, that people, those people that are against Jesus Christ, hey, it's very simple. Give them a witness if they still reject Jesus Christ, fine. Jesus said, take the dust, wipe it off your feet, and move on. But he does not say, you know, bring fire down like the sons of thunder wanted to do. Let Jesus Christ deal with that. In the meantime, you and I are supposed to know about the audiences. We're supposed to know about battling the audience. We're supposed to say, okay, as Jesus Christ cast out a devil, fielded a wicked accusation, he, of course, then gives this beautiful master Jesus argument clearly in the, the courtroom of God that you're not making any sense, that the kingdom that you're talking about that you're saying I'm part of is totally and completely wrong because a kingdom against itself, <laughs> why would I cast out the demons of the demons that I would want to have in somebody if I'm actually of Satan? Foolishness. 
But he makes that argument and clearly says, look, when it comes down to it, he that is not with me is against me. Maybe today we can see how the people that are against the Lord Jesus Christ are the ones that we can battle through in the right way to truly answer the questions because people truly are real in the audience that need Jesus Christ. Let me go through a series of things, and again, I'll go through them quickly. I'll do more of a little Bible study this morning. First one I see is that people are in wonder. Verse number 14, people are in wonder. Where do you get that from? It says, and it came to pass, when the devil was gone out, the dumb spake, and the people wondered. Some people in the audience, when, they, when we give the gospel, are amazed at the truth of God's power. They're really just overwhelmed by what God could do in his incredible power. Before this confrontation that we're going to look at in verse 15 and 16, consider this. Go back to Luke chapter number 9. We talked about this a couple months ago. 9, chapter number 9, verse number 41. And Jesus answering said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and suffer you? Bring thy son hither. How is this out of? Well, the three come down with Jesus Christ after going up to the Mount of Transfiguration. There is a man who has a son who wants to have the evil, wicked spirit kicked out of him, and the disciples could not do it. So he says, bring your son hither. He says in verse number 42, and as he was yet a coming, the devil threw him down, tear him, and Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the child, delivered him again to his father. And verse 43 and 4, and they were all amazed at the mighty power of God. They were all amazed at the mighty power of God. But while they wondered, everyone, uh, all the things which Jesus did, he said unto his disciples, let these sayings sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. And of course, they, could, they had a hard time swallowing that. Back to Luke 11. What is it about your life in Jesus Christ that's a miracle? Everything. Everything. So would we not get to the place where we would do better with telling people this miracle so that they would be in wonder. I cannot believe that you are a Christian. I cannot believe that you know Jesus Christ as Savior. What happened in your life? Well, I was going through this awful spell of life. I was searching for the truth. God really got a hold of me. He brought different people in my heart, I mean, into my life, and it just tugged at my heart. Somebody let me read the Bible and saw some scriptures. I had questions. They answered the questions. I said, ah, forget that baloney. I kept on going on with life. I hit some more tragic times. I kept on going through some hard things. I called up that person. I asked them to meet with me. They showed me that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes unto the Father but by him. They said, for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast that if thou, listen, listen, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. This person kept on showing me what the Bible said. There is none righteous, no, not one. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord. The person kept on telling me this stuff. I finally said, I'm going to give my life to God and ask Jesus to save my soul. And you walked away and went, my life is now crazy different. Yes. Yes. People, people are now in wonder. They're looking at you like, are you crazy? Yes, you are crazy in Jesus. Because you now have this miracle to tell. You don't need to have the power to cast out a devil or an unclean spirit. People can be amazed at Jesus in you, not just you in Jesus. Yeah. Would you like them to be amazed at both and wonder, how did this happen to you? What happened to you? I don't think Dave Huppert ever believed it, Bobby. I don't think Dave Huppert ever believed I was saved. I hope he gets saved someday. People are in wonder. Second thing. What else about people in the audience? People tempt Jesus. Oh, they like to tempt Jesus. The religious people are very clever. Watch this. Second one. It's found in verse number 15 and 16. What do you see there? Well, I see that he cast, 
they, 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 they come after him. Some said, you cast out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils. Others, tempting him, sought of him a sign from heaven. Some people in the audience, when you give the gospel, reject and defame the name of Jesus Christ. Don't they? Oh, you might find that out if you witness to some people. If some people come knocking on your door or you go knocking on someone else's life, I just want to sit and visit with you. I want to talk to you about some things that are very important to me. I was in church and there was this lunatic up there speaking and screaming and hollering and yelling about this audience, about Jesus Christ and how he was dealing with audiences. And I just, I got to tell you, I was just so convicted by the Holy Spirit and by the Word of God. You're a part of my audience of life. Can I talk with you? No, not right now, but maybe some other time. Wouldn't that be cool? But then there's the other people who are going to tempt you. They're going to tempt Jesus. Go to John chapter number 8. John chapter number 8. Very simply put, in this text, Jesus Christ is going back and forth with the religious geniuses of the day. They ain't know everything. They're arguing, fighting over being of Abraham's seed. And because they're of Abraham's seed, bam, automatically I'm in the kingdom. I'm born again. I'm, I have new life. I'm forgiven. No, just because you're in Abraham's seed. That's just a genetic thing that followed you through Israel and through the Jews. You need to believe in God. You, faith, excuse me, your faith as Abraham must be counted for righteousness sake. You must believe in me. And we pick it up in verse number 48 of John chapter number 8. This is after he said to these Pharisees and these people that are constantly tempting him, you are out of your father, the devil. He says in verse number 48, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say ye not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast the devil. Huh, that's how they're accusing and going after Jesus. Verse 49, And Jesus answered, I am not a devil, but I honor my father, and you, ye dishonor me, and I seek not my own glory. There is one that seeketh and judges. Verily, verily, I say unto you, If a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. You see, Luke's account is another battle. John's account's another battle. Matthew, Mark, Luke, there's accounts of Jesus Christ having to be confronted by the people that want to tempt him. He has shown divine power, divine goodness. He's clearly done a miracle. And they're saying, hey, give us another. Really? You are defaming the name of Jesus Christ. You are rejecting the power of God. Nothing different here. Jesus Christ continues in verse 51, Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead and the prophets, and thou sayest, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Basically, they're saying, how dare you say that you can speak word from God above Abraham and the prophets. Well, he'll give you an answer here if you just hang on a little bit. Verse 54, Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. He's my Father, and he's your God. You better get a handle on this as you tempt me. Verse 55, yet... Ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say, I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. Oh boy, did that get their attention. How in the world could they ever see Jesus? Let me give you an answer, he says. Verse number 57. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet 50 years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Amen. Woo! That leveled the playing field real quick, didn't it? They still kept on going after him, chiding him, gnawing at him. They put him on a cross because of that. It says in verse number 59, then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself, went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by, I add, and showing them incredible mercy. He could have wiped them all out at that moment. 
I bring this up because people tempt Jesus. They tempt you. They bait you. Somebody was baiting me in Target a few weeks ago. Oh, I wanted to knock him out. I had to calm down. And finally, I left that interaction saying, your theology is so far off. Oh, you've been deceived. <laughs> Maybe one day we could sit down and have a talk, if you wouldn't mind, about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the deity of Jesus Christ. And God the Father does not need a mother. And God the Son doesn't need a mother. And there is no mother God. The junk that's out there, wake up, everybody. They're tempting God and they're accusing Jesus of not being who he is. If you're going to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason the hope is in you with meekness and fear, you better get the first part of the verse together, right? But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. We've got to get there. A little better. We've got to do a little better. Sanctify, separate myself unto the Lord. And God, would you please clean up my attitude and clean up my heart for people Go back to Luke chapter number 11. There are lots of ground to carry and cover, but we're going to do this. Here we go. Here we go. Number three. People have thoughts. This is a fun joke around my house for years. The kids that I say, I'm getting some bad thoughts, kids. I'm getting some bad thoughts. Well, people have thoughts, don't they? People have these thoughts. How do you find that? Verse number 17, 18. Look at this. And he, but he, knowing their thoughts. So Jesus knew their thoughts. And he talks about this kingdom problem that they have, which he's going to straighten them out on. Some people in the audience, when we give the gospel, need strong rebuke about the kingdoms. Go to Matthew 12, real quick. I'm not going to cover this whole text. There's a lot here. This is a whole other study. If you want to go through this, this, we'll do a Bible Institute course on Matthew, and you can get everything you need. It'll take you about six hours a week. Maybe you'll sign up for it. I don't know. People have thoughts. This is a recounting of another counting of the Pharisees being rebuked. Some say this is a different one than the one in Luke. Some say it's the same. I would say like the Sermon on the Plain and the Sermon on the Mount. There is familiar context, but there's some different stuff here. So we can go either way with that, but I just want you to see some things. Verse number 22, then was brought unto him one possessed with the devil, right? Blind and dumb. He healed him insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. All the people were amazed and said, is not this the son of David? A little different text, right? Verse 24, but when the Pharisees heard it, they did what? This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. Jesus knew their thoughts. Verse 25, familiar. It said, every king divided the kingdom and divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if, watch, this is powerful now. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? You're accusing me of doing something that no one would do which is destroy its own kingdom. This is powerful, though. Verse number 27 and 28. A little bit different verb, verbiage and wording. And if I be bills above, cast out devils. By whom do your children cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Ooh. Back to Luke chapter number 11. There's so much there. Jesus answers the thoughts of wicked men. <laughs> they rejected God the Father. They rejected God the Son. They rejected God the Holy Spirit. You go through that text in Matthew 12 and you get down there about the blaspheme of the Holy Spirit. You, you understand the text and what happens in the time of Jesus Christ. They blasphemed his name, right? Right? The Holy Spirit hasn't come because the day of Pentecost hasn't come, but yet we know doctrinally and theologically when Jesus Christ says, when you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you're going to be in the Acts of the Apostles, and when you take out Stephen, another one of the apostles, you have now completely rejected all. Jews, You've blasphemed the Holy Ghost. He's the witness of the name of who? Jesus Christ. 
Ooh. They need a strong rebuke about the kingdoms. The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Verse number 20. But if I, with the finger of God, the spirit of God, cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. I am the resurrection and life. I am, I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am. And he's saying it's all fulfilled right here. He deals with the wicked people who have these thoughts. They tempt Jesus. The people that wondered, I think they're okay. They just had a wonderment and an amazement of what he could do. Just like the person would be in wonder if they found out that you were born again. Number four, we keep on going. We're going to get going here. Number four goes back to Luke 11, 21 and 22. An incredible encapsulation, like a, a mini couple of parables, a mini couple of little stories that really relate, like illustrations and pictures of how Jesus does his thing. Verse 22, but, uh, excuse me, verse 21, don't skip 21. When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. He's relating, if you see that the strong man is the devil, he'd be Satan. Strong man, right? Strong man. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him his armor wherein he trusted and divideth his spoil. How is it that you and I will not believe what Jesus Christ said, that he has destroyed Satan? Oh, he's just, he's at fault for everything. It behooves your study. It behooves all of our study to realize what Jesus Christ did on the cross. What Jesus Christ did in living color in Matthew's account and in Luke's account, he hammered him, buried him, Oh, we got devils and demons and things like that and spiritual stuff. Yes, that's because man is so wicked. Man loves sin. Has anybody figured that one out yet? You're the audience. Well, the devil this and the devil that and the devil this and the devil that. He is destroyed. Oh, no, he's not. Yes, he is. Well, he's, you know, he's stirring up a brew in the backyard it is the wickedness of this world that you live in. It's the wickedness of the flesh of mankind. Satan doesn't have to do anything to mess with people trying to kill each other. Have you figured that out yet? You and I, look at that, what it says. He's teaching them that the stronger man beat up the strong man. Well, I don't know about that then stop giving place to the devil. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, the rules and the darkness. Yeah, they're evil, wicked people. Spiritual wickedness in high places. What do you think that is? Well, there's just people flying around. They're demons and devils and they're flying around. And they're Okay, there's spiritual wickedness. I, I'm not, but why is it that we give credit to the one who's been defeated so very much? Has he got a little bit of generational activity going on? Gosh, he poisoned the nation of Israel for centuries. If anybody's been to the Joshua class that I'm doing on Wednesday nights, it's not hard for me to see it. You study the book of Joshua, study the book of Judges, and don't forget the lineage and generations and ages by which the people of God rejected the things of God. Is there a battle for you? Yes. The greatest battle in your soul, born again believer, is you. And you know that, don't you? Because the victor has overcome sin and death, and it's you and I. We spend five minutes in the Word of God, 10 minutes in the Word of God, 15 minutes in the Word of God. We read a little bit of what God says. We do a Bible study, and we wonder why our flesh is more powerful than Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit of God. 1 John 4, I'll just say it. I'll just read it. 
Let's read the text and read it as it's said by John the Apostle writing this letter to early church believers. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. False prophets, evil spirits. Yes? Well, it's... the, it's. What does the text say? Hereby know ye the Spirit of God, believer. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of, it's a spirit of antichrist. Do you know how much permission the devil has to do anything apart from God? Nothing. Nothing. He can do nothing without permission from holy God who runs his life in whatever essence that he is. And what am I saying today? That we look at the audience and realize they're blinded to the victor over sin and death. But if we're blinded to the victor, even though we're born again, we do nothing for that audience. Because it says in the end of verse number three and four, Come on. Where have you have heard that it's come true? And even now it is in the world. If he's writing this in the first century and it's in the world, what do you think it's in too? Still round. Ye are of God, little children. You and me, we're of God. We're little children have overcome them. Yes. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. But you just can't read that once in a while and just... You, we got to live there. I know, because I've tried to do it both ways, and it doesn't work the other way, which is to empty Jesus out of me and try to do it in my own power. I need the living word of God. I need the Holy Spirit of God. I need the name of Jesus Christ. I need to say, this is my story, and this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. When we live there, Oh my, now we go to this audience who says, I can never have, I can never be saved. I can never be forgiven. I'm the wickedest man on the face of the earth. Exactly. But I can introduce you to the victor who beat the strong man because he's stronger than him. Yeah. It's Jesus Christ. Right. We got to live there though or else people think we're nuts. Well, you don't live like that. But we can. Yeah. Because you had the spirit of God in you believer you have the word of god grow in it i hope that maybe a few more of us could learn more about him we would care a little bit more about the lost soul about the people around us about our family my family members then we would tell people who's stronger he is stronger Jesus is not messing around with words. He's using specific words for a specific point to make a specific truth clear. He's it. He's everything. And the audience needs that. Verse 23, this is a simple one, and yet it carries the greatest truth here. He that is not with me is against me. The audience needs to know who we're with. Are we with him or not? People need to know that we are with Jesus. We are with the holy God that said, I am, to those pharisaical people that thought they knew more than Jesus Christ knew. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth. Jesus pulls things together. Luke 9, real simple, real simple. We know what's going on here. We preached on it a couple months ago. Luke 9, 49 and 50. And John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him because he followeth not with us. And Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is as for us. Oh, yeah. We did a little break time years ago in Mighty Mites. There's only two ways the right way and the wrong way, the light or the dark, the good or the evil. Either Jesus or the devil. There's only two. And clearly, the people that are against God, <laughs> they need to be told, 
you have chosen to be on the wrong side. I'll read it all very clearly one more time. Some people in the audience, when we give the gospel, have chosen to be on the wrong side. Why don't you come to the side that wins? Why don't you come to the side that forgives, redeems, changes, reconciles, makes new, and you be one of those people that it says in 2 Corinthians, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. <sighs> that was so good. I remember leaving that moment, I still... It's like it happened la a minute ago. And I walked away from this place in this parking lot, and I thought I dumped the greatest dump truck of sin of all time. I was a wicked, evil, rotten man who had all the answers, except for the answer that God would ask me, which side are you on? And when I left that moment, I knew I was new, brand new. Just like you, just like you. Here's your last two. I'll cover them in 2.7 seconds. Here we go. No, I just lost that. Okay, here we go. Number six and seven. Here we go. Simple. Back to Luke chapter number 11. 24, 25, 26. Some people in the audience, when we give them the gospel, need a reality check on salvation and the true vine. Here's another encapsulation of great truth by Jesus' illustration. When the unclean spirit is gone of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest. That means that this person who had the devil in him, hey, the devil's been kicked out, the evil spirit's been kicked out, now he's going, woo! I'm better, I feel good. It's like someone going to NA or going to AA, go, oh man, I don't have that problem with drugs anymore. Go to John 15 as you're going, as, as I'm talking. But then Jesus is saying, as that person is seeking rest, I'll return unto my house whence I came out. And when he goeth, I mean when he cometh, he findeth is swept and garnished. Hey, my life on the external pieces of things is all new. Then goeth he and taketh to him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. What it simply means is this. This person wants to get some type of healing and fix from problems and maladies in life. Please heal me, God. I'll make a deal with you. If you get me out of this bed, I will just give you my life. But they've never, ever truly, completely said, I repent. Yeah, 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 that's good. So they repented of their old life, but they never asked Jesus to come into their life. So that spirit place within them still can be occupied. It's not a person who's converted who can then receive demons. It is a person who is never truly, after being emptied of the evil spirit, has then said, I will follow Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. I give my life to Jesus Christ. Do you follow? Or you can say that people can lose their salvation and that's what happened. That's not in the Bible. Jesus Christ basically is telling you, I am the true vine and my father is the husband. Chapter 15, verse 1. Every branch of me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. When you're, when you're in me, you're in me. You abide in me and I in you. That's Jesus. That's an abiding. As the branch cannot bear, for, bear, bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. Would you agree that he is the vine, the father is the husbandman, and we are the branches? Yes? He that abideth in me, you abide in him, and I in him. The same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. You are lost. Without me. You say that's just a spiritual application. Oh, really? Well, Jesus Christ himself in Luke 11 makes it very clear that an unclean spirit that got out of, his, out of a man, he walketh through dry places, and he's still susceptible to being filled again with evil spirits because he never said, replace that with Jesus Christ. So there's no Holy Spirit conversion. Because the Holy Spirit in you will be the one that tells everybody that you are a new creature in Christ. 
and that old things passed away, and behold, all things are coming to I don't know that theology. Make an appointment with Bobby, Dwayne, Brian, and Josh, and they'll show you. I'm available too. It's true, it's in the Bible. The Holy Spirit in you is what takes up residence. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, you ask what you will and it'll be done for you. Okay. I knew this would be fun. Last one and I'm done. I got 30 seconds. Here we go. Back to Luke chapter number. This is, this is a good one and it really it's a, it's a great one. Luke chapter number 11, verse 27 and 28. I mentioned and alluded to this. Hey, this woman lifted up her voice and said unto him, Blessed is the womb that bare thee. That's awesome that you had this incredible mother. This mother took care of you. This mother took care of you. And you have something great here. But what does he say in return of what she says? Verse number 28. But he said, but Jesus said, Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. It says up there very simply this. Some people in the audience, when we give the gospel, miss the need for relationship with the word of God. They want a better relationship here. They want a better relationship with their wives, their children. And that's good. Hey, Jesus, relationship with Mary, that's good. By the way, Jesus, you don't see him dogging that or saying anything bad about it in terms of his mother-son relationship. He didn't attack But what we see is this. Jesus says, rather, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keepeth it. Blessed, blessed are they. That's a powerful statement. Jesus said in his resurrection form, and John the apostle, he records things here at the end of John chapter number 20. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. It's a real thing. It is truly real. And the audience needs to know that, yes, they're very needy. Yes, they need to face hard truth. Yes, without question, when we think about the people that tempted Jesus Christ, the people that wondered over Jesus Christ, the people that were against God, people that could not believe his power, people that said, hey, Jesus, you're strong, but I think Satan's stronger. No, no, Jesus is stronger. You see, when it comes down to it up on the screen to finish out in our time of prayer is this thought. There are doubters and skeptics in the crowd that we witness to. It's a tough audience <laughs> to face sometimes. How can we navigate the contrary and the contentious audience that is completely skeptic about Jesus Christ? I sure hope you consider that you and I need to find out what the audience is like out there. Please stand for a word of prayer. Why don't you bow your heads for a word of prayer? Maybe you'd like to come forward a little bit and pray. Rick is going to start a song in the background. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray with you. And maybe just for the next two or three minutes, this is an important time of prayer for you and for me. Father in heaven, this is our time together. We've had a time in your word. We've had a time again in singing and praising and, and praying. And we've been a lot in the word, I know. But God, this is vital. Jesus, this is vital. There's an audience out there that sometimes we run from. I pray for the conviction upon my own heart and soul of all of us that we would, we would venture into the audience of our lives, that we would capture the opportunity to talk to souls that truly might be closer to salvation than we realize. I pray, Father, in this time, I pray, Jesus, in this time, I pray by the Holy Spirit's work that you will grab a hold of each one of your saints to dive in and deal with the audiences in Jesus' name. Please come.